Every revolution starts in the minds of the people. Arm yourself for the war of ideas. Take back your life. Take back your liberty. Tom Mullen talks freedom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Today, my guest is Tom Luongo. Tom is a former research chemist, amateur dairy goat farmer, a narco-libertarian, and obstreperous Austrian economist. He can explain what that word means to me when we talk, who now contributes to a variety of publications, including, but not limited to, Seeking Alpha, Russia Insider, Halsey News, and Newsmax Media. I discovered him on lewrockwell.com and at the Libertarian Institute and said, this is a guy that people need to hear a lot more from. Tom, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, Tom. I'm actually happy that I found your invite because I wound up on my spam folder because Microsoft is ridiculous when it comes to that. And I think you sent the, the invite like last week. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm really sorry about that. I just saw it. And, but the word obstreperous just means bombastic or really loud. I used in my Lou Rockwell bio, when I used to send articles directly to Lou and not publish, you know, now, now he just scrapes what I write over at my website over Goat Goats and Guns. I used to describe myself as an obstreperous Southerner training. I've now graduated to full on Southerner, but I used to be a Yankee and a, and a damn Yankee at that. It's been a long journey in the 35 years I've been down here in the South. So there it is. I want to get to an article that I just found on Libertarian Institute. And also I should mention, obviously, your blog and podcast is at goldgoatsguns.com. And we'll link to that on the show notes page. But a few months ago, and, and uh, as I said while we were talking just before we got on, uh, I have a book out called It's the Fed Stupid, which generally is just trying to convince different political movements, Occupy Wall Street, the Democratic Socialists, the economic nationalists, the MAGA people, everybody, look, whatever you think you care about, the Fed is much more important. What they do affects your life a lot more. And it gets into enough economics to convince them, but that's about it. But this article you wrote a few weeks ago, or it might even be a few months ago by now, was about the repo market. And despite you know, the Fed being an anti-freedom evil institution, we may have an interest in whether our Fed is the dominant one or some other central bank in another country is, you were writing that Powell is actually trying to protect the dollar through the repo market. Can you explain what the repo market is and what he's doing in there? Sure. So first things first, the Fed has both repos and reverse repos. And a, a, a repo is a reverse purchase contract. It's it, a, a, a repurchase contract, it's, which is simply that when you're short money and you have securities, you can repo a security to the Fed, which is basically a seven you know, anywhere from an overnight to a 14 day loan of I'll trade you the security for 14 days. You give me the money because I don't really need it for very long. I just need to cover. So I'm waiting for other in, you know, income to come in. I'm waiting. It's basically a payday loan for banks between banks. Uh, and the banks can always go to the Fed the repo window or the reverse repo window where the Fed now can take securities they have on their balance sheet and hand them out as lateral to banks that have maybe too many liabilities on their balance sheets, and but they have plenty of money. What the Fed was doing with the, as far as I could tell, back in June, the Fed was dealing with a couple of things. The first thing was that the federal government was going to start spending all this money that they raised under the Trump administration, but hadn't actually spent yet under the CARES Act. And they raised like $1.5 trillion worth of actual cash. That was going to start hitting the world. It was going to start hitting the domestic economy and the world economy, and it was going to cause inflation because you know, more money hitting the same number, or in our case, fewer goods because the supply chains have all broken down thanks to the willful destruction of our global economy by those I like to call the Davos crowd, which are basically all those globalists that Alex Jones has been talking about for 25 years now. But he, he gets less point, nutty every day, doesn't he, Alex well, Jones? Yeah, like he, my, my issue with Alex Jones is that he talks like a shaman, not that he talks like a, you know, an actual human being. If you, re, if you listen to Alex Jones and you think of him like a shaman, right, speaking in effectively metaphor for a great number of things, he makes a whole lot more sense. And, it, and just looking at him as a reporter, his record's getting better and better while CNN's gets worse and worse. But before you go on into what was going on there in the Fed, 
just to clarify for both myself and the listeners, I understood that the repo market generally was the way the banks complied with their the reserve requirements when they had one. But now they don't have one, so why do we need a repo market? Well, because they always still need overnight funding in order to keep their balance sheet. They still, they're still still Dodd-Frank. There's still other things in place, but they have to, in order to maintain any kind of stability for their own uh, purposes. Like during the COVID crisis, during the aftermath of COVID, you realize that the, the savings rate in the United States jumped to 33%. Now, the Fed usually freaks out, and all Keynesians do, when the savings gets around seven, seven and a half percent, they start freaking out. They either cut interest rates in the olden days, in the before time, they cut interest rates, in the before time being before Lehman Brothers. And then after Lehman Brothers, it was when are they going to start QE and just buy up all of the securities that the Treasury is printing in order to try and force savings out of the banks. Because remember, savings on, at the bank, your asset is the bank's liability, right? The for the bank, loans and securities are their assets, right? Banks' balance sheet is completely backwards from ours, our personal bank, our personal balance sheet. So you have to think, you have to realize that during times of high savings, the banks need securities in order to cover their savings. The balance, they have their balance sheets match. And if there's no collateral, if there's, if the Fed's buying everything, and there's no collateral out there. What do they have to do? Well, if everybody's saving too quickly, well, then the banks have to go to someone to try and get the collateral. If all the banks are doing this because they're all seeing a massive influx of savings, then the only place they can go to get collateral is because the Fed is the only one that has any securities to sell them. So this is why Bernanke created the reverse repo uh, facility originally, and it's why it's been used at times for the last 15 years or last 13 years since Lehman Brothers. So now, the interesting part about that is during COVID, all of the money that was being given out, either through the repo or reverse repo market, the Fed has the ability to create infinite amounts of what Martin Armstrong likes to call it, elastic money, create credit out of nowhere, and it only needs to exist for a certain period of time to, cl- to alleviate time mismatches within the market, within any particular market. Think of reverse repos and repos as like payday loans between banks, and normally, the, these markets operate through the private banking system. JP Morgan needs some today, needs some, needs some short-term paper today. They call it Goldman Sachs. If they execute a deal, blah, 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 blah. They have a market for this. But when that market seizes up, then they got to go to the Fed. And so back in May, you were looking at a situation where the overnight rate on, in the overnight markets were below zero. They were pegged at the zero bound. And we run the world's reserve currency. So we can't do what the ECB has done over in Europe. We can't run negative interest rates without losing all credibility that we actually run a a tight financial. I use that word very loosely, mind you, tight. We can't do that. What we have to do is we, Powell has been smart and has absolutely resisted the siren's call from Larry Summers and and all the rest of these MMT freaks, and I'll get into that later, of going negative on interest rates and allowing the markets, allowing the money markets to go into negative territory nominal and negative nominal yields, whether they're real yields or not is a different issue, but negative nominal yields. What Powell did in June at the same time, at, on the same day as the Biden-Putin summit over in Geneva was to raise the reverse, was raise the payout rate, what they would pay on a reverse repo from 0% to five basis points or 0.05%. What he did was he went from having there being no incentive to buy a repo other than the gross collateral to, you know, I'm going to actively drain dollars from the market by handing out treasuries at five basis points, which was better than they can get in the overnight markets because the overnight markets were pegged at 0%. The two things he needed to do, Jeff Snyder over to Lomber Partners identified this at the time. He said, we're pegged at the zero bound. So the Fed has to figure out how much they're actually, how, what's the latent actual, what's the actual yield here? They don't know because they won't let it go below zero. So by raising it to five basis points, he did two things. One, he uncovered what the short-term rate, the short-term market rate was actually was, which was it rose to about three and a half basis points. So the actual, before he made that move, the actual rate people would have been willing to pay was like negative 0.01 or negative 1.15 or 1.5 basis points. He uncovered that, but at the same time, sent the balance on the reverse repo 
facility from about $400 billion standing. Now, these are anywhere from zero to 14 day contracts that are constantly being rolled over with, a, with an actual balance to 1.7 trillion by September by Jackson Hole. So he removed from the market $1.2 trillion in what is effectively, from a global, per, global plumbing perspective, base money. It would be like, think of the amount of actual dollars that are running around, right, as the M0 of the world or the M1 world. He trained $1.2 trillion in three months. Okay, yeah, we spent a lot of those as well, but he still... It, to be honest with you, when you look at the, the I, I did a, a post where I, I, I analyzed the changes in the Fed's balance sheet and the Treasury Department's balance sheet and everything else, really, he sterilized more than half of the spending that the Treasury did over the summer. It was like something like net of seven, eight, 700 to $800 billion. The nominal amount of the reverse repo balance sheet went from about 400, 450 billion to 1.7. But the total of the Fed's machinations of moving money around netted out at about 750 800 billion dollars still a tremendous amount and this is what's caused the breakdown of on the news that that happened when he did that the euro collapsed from a dollar 22 to a dollar 19 in five minutes okay like the euro bull market which had been well eh, maybe it could it's it, it could come no over done completely kaput okay the euro was done the Japanese yen, you know, it's bull market against the dollar, done. The Fed came out and said, we're defending the dollar. It's all the only conclusion you can make. So now you have to ask in a greater geopolitical sense, what's happening? Just to clarify what you just said, he's drained dollars out of the economy. He's hurt the euro. That, that all makes sense. How does that square though against the Fed's balance sheet being twice what it was two years ago and the M1 money supply? doesn't matter because everybody else has done the same thing. Okay. I mean, it matters in the long run. Oh, don't get me wrong. The Fed is like flying in the coffin corner here, but we're talking about what's happening right now. Okay. And also against the other banks. So is he trying to keep it the healthiest horse in the glue factory? Yeah. The, the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. It's yeah. However you want to put it. The, the best looking girl at the wallflower committee. I, I, <laughs> no, pick your poison. I don't care. Pick your metaphor. Run with it. What matters is, is that that it's not, at this point, it's not about the amount of money. The amount of money that's out there is irrelevant because it's so enormous that it's the debt's unpayable. The entitlements that those debts have been racked up against are unpayable. Like all of the numbers are, don't focus on the numbers at this point. It's not important. What's important is what do every one of these movements mean? Because previous from the minute COVID started, it was an operation to get rid of Donald Trump. Okay? It was an operation to get rid of Donald Trump because they didn't have control of the U.S. political system. They had bureaucratic control, but they lost executive control. Okay? They still have bureaucratic control. We're seeing that everywhere. The, they being Davos. What I call Davos. And Davos is the is that group of international globalists and bankers and oligarchs and old European money. And, and it's, but it's a, and I've done extensive podcasts on this going back into the, into the history, not the history of it, but really what I'm, what I mean when I say Davos, just very nuanced look at all this, but it's a way of personalizing it. This is the metaphor you need to understand. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not British. It's not American. It's not this. It's globalist. Okay, it is a bunch of people who think they run the world and have agents everywhere implementing their policy for them. And when you see people, when you see presidents and heads of the CDC and these international organizations doing really dumb things, it's because they're under orders. Those aren't bugs. They're not incompetent. It's a feature of policy designed with a specific mind, a purpose in mind, which is to vandalize and destroy the existing Understand that if we move to central bank digital currencies, there's no need for the commercial banks. We don't need Goldman Sachs in a world where the Fed just issues you the money to buy a house directly from your digital Fed account. And the interest rate you pay is based on your social credit score. 
That's the point of the central bank digital currencies that are coming. Powell's come out against all of these things. He's come out, he's, like, he's talked out of both sides of his mouth all the time. When the, Fed, the head of the Federal Reserve says, yeah, we're going to do a study on that. They'll take five years. That's the Fed saying, we're not doing it. When you hear EC, when you hear Christine Lagarde say it over at the ECB, understand that whatever she says, they're six months or a year ahead of whatever schedule they're, they're, they're talking about because they need this because Europe is already a zombie as a continent. So what he did, what Powell did by raising the reverse repo rate to five basis points is he got off of Davos's agenda because Davos's agenda was to install Joe Biden as president, install the Democrats as the in charge of all three branches of government, in, intimidate the Supreme Court into inaction over everything they want to do and pass all these terrible spending bills that then puts the Fed on the hook to monetize all of this debt that the that Congress has just spent. Everybody focuses on how much money is out there. Everybody forgets to, to talk about the fiscal side of things. When we don't have our fiscal house in order because we got a bunch of crazy commies, literal communists running our government, saying the only way for, for us to ha- implement our communist takeover is to print $12 trillion over the next three years and then force the Fed to monetize it all because the world doesn't want it. There's no appetite for $12 trillion with the U.S. Treasuries. So the Fed will have to expand its balance sheet. They're the, only, they're the buyer of last resort here. What does that do to the dollar? How does, that, how does that make the Federal Reserve chairman have any power whatsoever? He doesn't. Nancy Pelosi has all the power. While Biden, you know, sporifies in his chair as a mushroom and rubber stamps whatever they put in front of him. That's the reality of the world we live in today. I don't like that's it's just that simple. Understand that we have vandals in charge of policy selling out the United States and everybody else to globalist interest. They want to move all this, they want to move the center of power to Europe and eventually give it all to the United Nations. Oh, by the way, Alex Jones is right about that too. And and, and when Powell did this, he literally said, Yeah, but they can destroy all that with five little basis points. And drain all the drain all the dollars, and now you're and there's nothing you can do about it. So I wasn't planning on talking about him until you brought it up, but I'm going to have to ask you. As a libertarian, sometimes I just don't know what to make of Trump. Other than he seems to be hated by all the right people, he doesn't say too much that I agree with, but I somehow feel like I should be I don't know somewhat sympathetic to him. As a doctrinaire libertarian, Trump is horrible. He's a boomer. No, no offense to the boomers in the audience. Your ideology stinks because it's just it's given us this neo utopian Marxist fantasy that we can just we can just print money and spend our kids in the debtors' prison and it won't matter. And then when the bills come due, we'll just get rid of the debt. That's what they're doing. This is and Trump. I, I wrote about this actually this morning a little bit for my patrons in a private blog post over. I have a Patreon over Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns. And when I said this morning was that Trump's problem as president was that he's an old boomer who believed the lie of the magic money tree of the Federal Reserve. That, and he believed, like so many of them, that their success came from their insouciance and ability to leverage the system to create wealth for themselves. And see, I'm successful. So when what they've done is they've just allied themselves with the Ponzi scheme. And they've ridden the Ponzi scheme up, and, they'll, and, they'll, and, and now they don't want to lose the... They don't want to lose their position. Trump got into office, and as David Stockman has pointed out to unbelievable levels of, of, because he writes every day on this, that Trump was not going to fix the fiscal side of anything. He was actually going to make it worse because he believes in, hey, let's just deficit spend and we'll grow our way out of this, which with the numbers that we have are not possible, not without sincere reforming of all of the big entitlements, the whole social safety net, getting axing major departments. It means re, uh, reforming Social Security, Medicare, all of that stuff. Because taxes only cover the, taxes don't cover any of the discretional spending. That all comes out of the budget deficit at this point. So that was Trump's Achilles heel, was his ideology, which is that he could deficit spend his way out of it because he's because at the end of the day, he's just a cheesy research um, uh, real estate developer from Queens. That's who he is. <laughs> And so when you understand the people, the mindset, then you're going to understand him. But his heart was in the right place, but he could not actually follow through. And then he was just, then he was trapped and they, 
And he did his best to expose a lot of this. And I give him props for that. And I thank him for his service, to be honest with you. But he's no libertarian. And that doesn't, but that doesn't matter. We're not in the, it, we can't be doctrinaire about anything other than our analysis at this point. Libertarianism in Austrian economics gives us a valuable analytic tools. They give us no help in getting out of this problem that we're in beyond that. Okay, because right now the world's getting really tribal and the tribes are getting smaller. And that's conceptually, philosophically, as libertarians, we know how to deal with that. Okay, but understand that politics got us into this mess. It's not going to get us out. And you vote for the guy who's that's going to do the least amount of damage. And or you don't vote at all because you don't like to encourage them, which is generally the way I look at things. Um, but pick your poison here but we have very valuable analytic tools here that are powerful that can help us explain what's going to happen when they do these dumb things print six trillion dollars yeah i agree with everything you just said and one of the things i've said before in simpler manner is my problem with trump is he's too conventional his foreign policy was a little bit better because it wasn't so crazy it wasn't as crazy yeah it wasn't as crazy he he just didn't but he never, it would never occur to him that we should just bring all the troops home from Germany or Japan or anything like that. He wanted to do that. He could, he wasn't allowed to do that. There's so much malfeasance that's coming out now. How his advisors fed him bad information on purpose and all this stuff. It, it was just bad. He, Trump's biggest mistake is that he didn't go in and literally fire everybody in the top four floors over at the State Department. Like he got rid of most of the top four. He needed to get rid of the top four floors. He needed to literally shut down the CIA for, for the entirety of his presidency. He needed to do all of it. And it was funny when he was going in, even though I didn't agree with it, just about anything he was campaigning on, other than he said, when he campaigned, he said the opposite. He said, we need real interest rates and they're propping up a phony economy. I don't know where that all went, because as soon as he got in there, he was like, what? We need lower rates. He, we, I understand what he was talking about. He wanted, in the short term, he wanted growth in order, because he's a mercantilist. So he thought he can go in and raise taxes, or not raise taxes, raise tariffs on everybody else, punish them for trading with us. And it's like he's got bad economic theories. He's yeah. Keynesian. He's got bad economic theories. And he's a bully. And that's who he is. And we knew all of these things going in. We didn't vote for Trump. I voted for him twice. I didn't vote for Trump because I thought he was brilliant. I voted for Trump as the biggest two fingers up to the establishment in human history because that's what we needed to do okay you won't let us have a voice at the table you won't let us speak you will because i know they've been rigging elections before ron paul was on the scene and they rigged the elections against ron paul dude I mean, bernie sanders has got nothing over on ron paul he actually won the damn primaries and they gave him the Mitt romney anyway but they like we didn't vote for Trump for any of that. You said, well, fine. You're going to take our vote. You're going to take everything away from us. You're going to take our voice. You're, going to, you're not going to allow us to be have a seat at the conversation. You're at the table in the conversation. You're going to take everything and put it on the three by five card, as Tom Woods puts it, the three by acceptable three by five card of, of American. No, we're going to vote for that guy because we're not voting for her. Let's take a short break for this important message. Friends, I've seen a lot of political movements come and go over the 14 years I've been writing about politics. The right went from being dominated by the interventionist neoconservatives to the anti-deficit Tea Party to the economic nationalism of the MAGA movement. The left went from Obama's hope and change, whatever that meant, to Occupy Wall Street to Bernie Sanders, the squad, and democratic socialism. Through it all, the one institution that causes most problems with the American economy has escaped serious criticism. My new book, It's the Fed, Stupid, is an appeal to Americans across the political spectrum to stop supporting politicians and policies that don't make a difference and focus on the one institution that causes most of the problems they worry about, the Federal Reserve System. Download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com. And now, back to our episode. You work on the answer, then you quietly save the day. You were right, Mr. Spock, about everything you said. We humans just are logical.
And that's what happened. In the same way the Brits, when they got the opportunity to vote to, to get out of the EU, no matter how much they scared, they tried to scare the British people with this, everybody in the Midlands was like, no, we want out. We hate the EU. We want our country back because they understood what the, the problem was. Like they hate the technocrats in their own country. Brussels technocrats, French and German technocrats to a British, you might as well like stick forks in their eyes to get them to vote for that. And it's the same kind of thing happening with you know, running Hillary Clinton for president. And they, you thought you were going to you know, take, you were going to carry 35 or 40 states. They didn't cheat well enough, obviously, because they were too confident. I didn't vote for Trump. I'm in New York, so it really didn't matter who I voted for. But I did understand why people did. And I was talking to a friend and they're like, how could a libertarian vote for Trump? And I said, to me, it's like a hand grenade. And <laughs> we're not going to elect a, a libertarian anytime soon. So we might as well pull the pin, throw him in there and see what happens. Murray Rothbard voted for everybody. He voted in every election. He always, he always voted tactically. Murray Rothbard said, you vote for who's ever in front of you. Because the, word, the, the, the guy, who, there's, there's no comparative advantage in not voting. There's comparative advantage in voting for the guy who's going to do the least. You vote. It's, a, it's purely selfish, and you act on your own self enlightened self-interest. It's an argument, and you could also say well, the difference between them is, is so minuscule that I'd rather keep my integrity and say I don't vote because I don't like to encourage them, which is what I did for many years. Or you vote for the libertarian knowing he doesn't have any chance of winning. Or you run for public office and know that you have no chance of winning. The system is rigged against you. The voting system is designed to ensure that no changes happen. The, you're not going to change the system from within. The Koch brothers were wrong. I, I can go over all the history on this stuff. They took over Cato and forced out Rothbard in order to, because they wanted to take the institutions over from within. It didn't work. They all became neocons. And they, they seem to always be begging for approval from the establishment we're supposed to be opposing. Just look on a map as to where their address is and you'll find out why. The Cosmotarians. I think that's what, um, who is it used to? <laughs> Cosmotarians or there was another term that came out of the, out of you know the Auburn set over at the Mises Institute, yeah, regime libertarians, you know, I mean, it's, they just believe that oh, if we just soften it, so Rand Paul is one of these people, like so I got no use for him until he gets truly radicalized. I don't like Rand; he's fine for what he is, but he likes getting reelected more than he likes anything else, and so he's not his dad, and it's a shame that he's not his dad, and it's a shame that at this point, after six years or however long he's been in Congress or in the Senate, that he hasn't become his dad. And, you know, because he should have at this point. I think the pushback on that for him is he sat there and watched his dad for 40 whatever years, taking the right position, voting alone and said, look, he was right about everything, but nothing happened. And if I could play the game, I'm not saying he's right about this, but I feel like what he's saying is if I play the game and I never really vote for anything that's bad, but I endorse people and whatever, I can get something done. It's a loser strategy. It's why he was immediately bounced from the presidential primaries. That's a beta male strategy. You don't run that way. This politics is about being the dude. It's simply about that. You are, and this is what Trump had understood and had right and knew you know, from the moment he walked on the stage that he had all these people licked. That's the libertarian problem is that people are starving for this radical message and the libertarian party seems to want to convince everybody we're safe they don't want safe they want a bomb thrower that's why they elected trump you still want to be flower throwing anarchists but you still want to be you don't want to ever suck up to these people you don't want their approval okay they're never going to apologize for the people they've murdered they're never going to apologize for lying to you never they will go, they are narcissists. They will go to the gallows screaming that they didn't do it. <laughs> That's who they are. Hillary Clinton will never admit to all the people she's killed. Period. You're not going to, I watch this on Twitter all day long with what I call normie cons. They do this all day long, hoping that eventually if we just prove it to them, how how evil they are, that eventually they'll have to admit that they were wrong. Are you kidding me? No. Do religious zealots admit the fact that they're, no. They're evil and they're vile and there's no depth that, there's no depth that they will not sink to in order to stay out of prison. So they're going to, so they're going to keep running the vaccine passport thing, even though COVID is done. 
they're going to they're going to pull old men out of wheelchairs in Germany and beat them up for not wearing a mask. This is what they're going to do. And you're not ever going to get any satisfaction from them when they turn around and go, really, you were right. Okay, if that's what you want, if you want their approval, I'm sorry, go have, you want somebody's approval, go hire a therapist. You want to win this freaking war against evil people? You call them out for who they are. And every once in a while, you allow yourself, and this is where I get angry with libertarians. Every once in a while, you do the hard work of the analysis to realize that at times, these evil, some of these evil people will have aligned interest with you. And you have to be willing to hold your nose and go, yeah, Jerome Powell right now is working for us. In a year or two, oh, he's, but he is the only person who can beat Europe because he has the power. It's why they went after Kaplan and Rosengren, and they did, and now they're getting Clarita off of the FOMC. Well, they went after Powell over this insider trading stuff. Even Daniel DiMartino Booth doesn't want to believe that there was an insurrection, that there was a, a globalist-run insurrection against the Federal Reserve to oust the sitting Fed chairman to put in their pet Marxist brainer. Okay? And she got to that state right at the, the terminal Part, part, part of that. But that was the response. Powell raised the reverse repo rate, trained all the tra- drained all this money from the markets. What's the next strategic move? He moves his you know, rook forward. He places this piece on the go table. What do they do in response? Well, they try to take over the Federal Reserve. So that they can, and Janet Yellen was out there talking about how, you know, Bitcoin is evil and this is evil and we need to pay, build, pass Build Back Better and we need to coordinate monetary policy for climate change and yeah, all of this stuff. And what happened? The minute Powell won his fight against the insurrection within the Fed, Yellen changed her tune completely. All of a sudden, inflation is not transitory anymore. All of a sudden, yeah, we don't need really need Build Back Better, blah, 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 blah. And now they're just backpedaling and mealy-mouthing the whole thing. You have to be able to watch who – you have to understand who these people actually represent. As Robin Williams used to say, I really wish our politicians would just wear stickers of who they're owned by so at least we know that they're honest about it. It's the same thing with these people. What they say will tell you what team they play for. And the problem with Davos is that it was a loose coalition of various evil thieves. It's a cartel of thieves and rent seekers and oligarchs. They all had their different agendas, though. And they were all willing to win as long as nobody had to be sacrificed on the altar of the new technocratic, more perfect technocratic union, (coughs) otherwise known as the European Union. And the minute it became obvious that the commercial banks were going to be the ones sacrificed, and the Fed works for the commercial banks because who's the shareholder of the – who are the dominant shareholders of the New York Fed? All the major commercial banks. J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, blah, 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 all the way down the line. They're the ones who capitalize it. They're the ones who are the shareholders. So when you stop to think about this, if they were going to be thrown out of the new monetary system and they weren't going to be given a seat at the table, do you really think Jamie Dimon was going to give up all that power because climate change? Because a bunch of your old European money who hates him said you need to do this? If you think that, then you don't know Jamie Dimon. And that was the moment when I sat back and I went, oh, that's what's going on. Private equity Powell works for these guys. And they still, at their as much as they're evil, horrible, they still want to be able to have their seat at the table. And so that's all you have to really think. It's really all you have to, to do to, to understand it. He works for them. Now you do what I need you to do. And what do I need you to do? Let's start, let's start draining Europe of the, all their capital and see how powerful they are. Then let's work the phones behind the scenes and get the Senate to not pass any of the infrastructure, all the spending. Let's clean up the fiscal side of things and let's drain the monetary side of things and then see how the world reacts to that. And that's where we are right now. So I think of all the people that are saying we're going to have a problem with the dollar, would you say that because of what Powell and the Fed is doing, 
the dollar will remain what it is and what it has been? Or I, I want to get to your new article to wrap up here about Bitcoin. Are you optimistic, pessimistic? I'm not. I, it all depends on what time frame you're talking about. The dollar is going to go through a significant rally over the next 18 to 24 months. Interest rates are going to rise. The bigger question you have to add, there's still a lot to deal with. We have a potential you know, nuclear war with the Russians over in Ukraine. None of this, all of this could be moot in three months. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think the Russians are very skillfully backing NATO into a corner and it's all going to break down. And I'm watching the Russian ruble this morning and I don't see any, I don't see it, but what I think is going to happen is as follows. Like the big question is whether the GOP reforms itself and uses this historic opportunity the same way that Boris Johnson took hold of the historic opportunity over in Britain to wind up with the largest, you know, swing in uh, vote and in, in, in the makeup of parliament in the history of parliament and wind up with an 83 seat majority because of Brexit. The same thing is sitting at the feet of the GOP. They have an opportunity. Powell has already led the way. We don't need Build Back Better. We don't need that money. We don't need any of that. You know, what we, we need to get our fiscal house in order. And so the GOP under Trump, nominally under Trump, pushes into the primaries all of these, you know, then what amounts to a group of, you know, people who are willing to level with us and go, yeah, we need to fix everything. We're going to start now. And by 2024, they laid the groundwork in the back half of the Biden administration. Like they, they laid the groundwork during the back half of the Carter administration. So that by the time they're done, they put somebody in power outside of Davos' control that is going to do what Reagan and Volcker did. Powell's already set the stage for this. Now the question is whether there's the political will in Washington to get it done. And if so... If you don't think that the world is not desperate at this point for the United States to lead us out of this global insanity monetarily, you're crazy. Capital screaming for this. It desperately wants to fall out of flow out of Europe. It desperately wants to even flow out of China and Asia and Japan and everywhere else and come here. We've given them no reason for that because Davos is controlling our freaking government and doing everything imaginable to make us look like morons. That's why talks in Geneva are so important because if the if we go to to, to if there's some kind of hot war in Europe, okay, NATO's going to get its hiney handed to it. I'm trying to be nice here. Normally, I'm much more colorful. Like NATO's going to get crushed. The Russians will wipe the they will run the table with them. And it will puncture the idea that the Americans could ever fight a war against China, okay, in our current military setup. So that has to, so NATO has to come out of Eastern Europe and save face and not break down illusion so that we can execute the pivot to deal with China. Putin doesn't want the United States humiliated because otherwise, 20 years from now, Russia gets consumed by China. So thinking long term, Europe and the United States need to fall, but they don't need to be humiliated. If that occurs, if what I think is going to happen occurs, then you set up the situation where all the Americans have to do, all we as Americans have to do, is literally say, we're ready to end the empire overseas and fix our domestic spending here at home. If that happens and we get a massive GOP win in November, that brings in a bunch of fire-breathing fiscal conservatives that run on the idea we're going to fix our, our, our fiscal house. That lays the groundwork for the reform of Social Security, the reform of Medicare, the reform of Obamacare, and all of this stuff that is just literally destroying our ability to run a reasonable society. Then Powell will have the, the headroom to raise rates and make it And the next two or three years could be very bullish for U.S. assets. And that will actually create a firestorm where the dollar rises to some ridiculous number from 96 to 130 or 140, which will then eventually cause another problem. It's not like we're going to get out of this in such a way that it's not going to be pain, massive pain. And it's going to cause the kind of recession and the kind of depression that we saw under Volcker and, Volcker and Reagan. But the question is whether it's messaged properly or not. If it's messaged properly, we'll accept it. But if they keep running the boomer script of, oh, no, all we have to do is go to the magic money tree and print more money, everything will be fine. 
you know, pay 13% on your credit cards, but you can have a, a point and a half on your car loan. So question on the possibility there of what you just said. And when I look at the history of federal outlays and receipts, spending never decreases. It always goes up. It goes up the slowest when there's a Republican Congress and a Democratic president. Mm -hmm. Is that the best scenario, do you think? I don't know. I, at this point, I don't think the party labels matter because they're both really Davos. You have to get rid of both the GOPE and the DNC. The Democrats are headed for the worst kind of com com complete collapse as an organization. My, my friend and partner, Dexter White, likes to call them the coalition of the aggrieved. They're not actually a party, right? And that party is splintering. That coalition is splintering. The same way that Davos is a coalition of old money. And guess what? The old money is all going to get lynched because they're now eating their seed corn over in Europe in a way that is truly dangerous. Like old French and Belgium and Swiss and Italian money is, they're all going to get turned on. The same thing with the, with the royal family over in Europe. They're in serious trouble. And they keep doubling down because they, that's all bullies know how to do. And they're going to double down until we take them to the gallows, metaphorically speaking in Minecraft, however you want to put it. And unfortunately, this is not going to end without violence, right? It's going to be bad. It's going to be ugly. There's not going to be any way of, of avoiding that. There's going to be millions more people are going to die, and there's going to be skirmishes and hot wars, and hopefully not between major powers. And there's going to be low-level conflicts, and we're going to pull out of, we're, we're already pulling out of Asia. We're, the, we pulled out of Altan from Syria the other day, or pulled most of the people out of there. And yeah, maybe they've only moved to Jordan, but they're not covering the Al-Bukhamai you know, border crossing between Iraq and Syria anymore, which, is, which means that goods and services are going to be able to flow freely into Syria, and our occupation of Syria is going to end. If we're leaving Syria, and we're leaving Afghanistan, we've already left Afghanistan, and we're, looking, we're going to leave Iraq, what's left? Ukraine? And we're negotiating over Ukraine with the Russians right now. So all that's coming home, and that's a good thing. That's going to happen under Biden. It should have happened under Trump, but the Democrats wanted the political win to have it happen under Biden. But the impetus started under Trump. Sure. I wish he would have trusted his instincts more and not listened to the people around him because his instincts were pretty good on all that stuff. Absolutely. Real fast before we wrap up, just how does Bitcoin fit into all this? That's part of your article. So Bitcoin is the big question, right? Is Bitcoin, as one commenter, prolific commenter on my blog likes to say all the time, is it our revolution or their? I'm firmly of the opinion that it's our revolution. They will attempt and have been attempting to co-opt it, take get control of it, try and control the supply of it by because they missed the boat originally. So now they're like turning the price in the 30s and 40s and 50s in order to try and buy as much of it as possible. So then they can control it through the futures market like they did the price of gold and all that other rotten nonsense that you've heard. You know, if you're in this space, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Whether you're talking to Alistair McLeod or Turk Ferguson or any of the, the people in this space, all of whom I know and all of whom are good people. But Bitcoin as a technology, and this for cryptos in general, and certainly proof of work style cryptos, it's a technology they can't control. And it's a technology that ultimately will free us from the centralized control of new monetary units. How that roadmap happens, well, it's anybody's guess. But I know where it ends because. They can't compete against it. They know they can't compete against it. They're going to try and give us inferior versions of it, and those inferior versions will be metastable for a few years. Remember, like Murray Rothbard used to talk about this all the time. If you ever read What Has the Government Done to Our Money in the, in the Case for the, the Gold Reserve Center? In, in there, he talks about the, the breakdown of the Bretton Woods and the 64-page pamphlet they wrote. And it's a very quick summary of the transition from Bretton Woods to the Dollar Reserve Standard. But we had four monetary systems between eight, 1968 and 1971, okay? They were short-lived. They lasted six months. And then you know, the next one, and then they tried another Band-Aid and another Band-Aid, another Band-Aid, until eventually Nixon closed the gold window and went on to what I like to call Milton Friedman's nightmare, okay? I could fight one person, I'd fight Milton Friedman, just wolf in sheep's clothing all the way down the line. Fake libertarian 101, absolutely. The same thing is going to happen over the course of the next decade we're, or, or two, and we're going to transition to a private monetary system. It's already here because the ethos of Bitcoin has not been corrupted. 
Okay, when you want when you go and you read the religious zealots that are Bitcoin, that is Bitcoin Twitter, and you listen to the way they talk. I went to Bitcoin 2021 last June, and I was amazed. And amidst all this carnival barker stuff and the beginning, amidst all of this, all the money flowing in and all the obvious corporatization of everything, I'm like, the core message is still the same. The hell with the man. This is what we want. What do we want? Sound money. When do we want it? Now. It's that simple. And because that desire is there, it will be expressed in the marketplace. And it will win because it's superior technology to anything that the technocrats are going to put in front of us. All they can do is beat us, but they can't win. What does it do to the dollar based on everything you've said about Powell and what he's doing to the Europeans? How does Bitcoin align with that? Or I expect at some point, Powell's not going to be around for what happens. In the short term, the dollar is going to rise. And he's going to do his best to beat everybody else. Because if, if anything, he wants to be the, rightly so, be the last central bank. Powell has not been as hostile to Bitcoin as people think he is. Meaning at some point, and remember, Wall Street wants in on Bitcoin. And they have been, they moved in 2021, they moved into Bitcoin in big ways. And there are hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investment capital going into Bitcoin mining and proof of work style mining all across the United States. Transitioning away from the dollar standard to a Bitcoin standard where the dollar just becomes another stable coin within the, the world built on the, 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 the back of a, an, an extra pyramid built on, uh, on Bitcoin. It frees the United States from Trippin's paradox. It frees the world from a reserve, from a singular reserve currency that any one political unit has control over. Now we just let the market fight it out. And you let all the Bitcoin style coins fight it out for who has control and whether or not we create a basket of them or not, or do we need more of them or fewer of them or whatever? I don't know, but I can tell you what's there. And anything that they're writing into Bitcoin core today can be, because it's open source, can be rolled into Monero or Decred or Zcash or pick your Dash or whatever. And you pick your poison, pick your proof of works Bitcoin style coin or some new Bitcoin style coin that has yet to be launched. Like it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's they're playing they're playing whack-a-mole against innovation that is happening so fast. They don't even know how to categorize these things. They're still arguing whether what Ethereum is a security or not. Right. This is government we're dealing with. This is when we as libertarians have the cheat codes. We just have to trust ourselves that we have the cheat codes. The cheat code is these people are incompetent and malevolent. Their bosses are malevolent. The quizlings are incompetent. The managers are incompetent. We, and Davos loves their midwits running things because they love weak governments. So that's how they take them over and make them do the things that they want them to do. Eventually, those midwits screw things up so badly that everybody sees through it and the thing starts to collapse. And that's where, that's where we are right now. Six months from now, ev everything is going to look completely different and yet completely the same. They'll still be trying to implement digital passports and take away our freedom and take away our freedom of movement and scapegoat the unvaxxed. And there'll be Twitter videos of people getting beat for not being vaccinated and all the rest of it. And yet everything will have changed as well because the Europe will be in the middle of the sovereign debt crisis. Governments will have fallen, blah, 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 blah. But that's where we're headed for. And this is that, that kind of fourth turning thing. It's going to go on for at least another 10. That sounds like an interesting introduction to some future episodes. I hope you'll come back. We got to get an episode where we just talk about the State Department. <laughs> foggy bottom it's just bad it's evil we'll definitely have you back and we'll tear into that as well what's the best place for people to go to find you sure um my blog is at uh, tomlawongo.me or goldgoatsandguns.com you can find me on twitter at tfl1728 and of course i have a patreon where i do i do a monthly investment retail centered newsletter with uh, exclusive exclusive content and uh, podcasts as well. But all that stuff's available through the site, but the Patreon is where you can go to support me directly financially and get exclusive content because I write three to four times a week for my patrons, either in the form of uh, uh, video market reports, video podcasts, 
going over the markets and or just previews of future blog posts. They, they start embryonic form there and then make it out into the, the general public. So the Patreon is where everything is. We'll have all that on the show notes page. And I want to thank you for being on, Tom. And I look forward to the next time you can make some time for us. Appreciate it, Tom. You'd be well and keep your stick on the ice. Okay, friends, that's going to do it for today. If you haven't already, don't forget to download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com. And I'll see you next time. The war of ideas has only just begun. Arm yourself with the knowledge you need by heading to TomMullenTalksFreedom.com and subscribing to our email list. And remember, every revolution starts in the minds of the people.